Hello and welcome back to the Diaries of Space Explorers. I am your host Gavin Tolomedi and boy do we have an episode for you. Now I want you to picture something very small that's able to turn your own waste into material that could be used for 3D printing. Crazy right? Well not anymore because thanks to Alina Kuniskaya who is a PhD student in bio and mechanical engineering at the University of British Columbia with a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, has been working on this project that's able to turn astronauts' fecal matter and recycle them into 3D printable bioplastics using microbes and bacteria. Now we get to learn about this project from her and her journey about how she was able to find the space sector by taking initiative, by looking for opportunities through her own student institutions, and then to be volunteering with Seth's character, currently standing as the director at large. Without further ado, let's get right into the episode. I want to dive right in, so um, welcome Alina to the show. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I was wondering if you could maybe tell myself and the audience a little bit about yourself and what it is that brought you into the field of space. Yeah, so I'm currently doing a PhD in biomedical engineering at the University of British Columbia, and I have a background in chemical engineering. And my journey and my interest into space started in high school. It was one of my teachers that first uh, mentioned that maybe I should be an astronaut uh, to me. And that just kind of got me interested in, you know, what what do astronauts do and what is space exploration, particularly human space flight. And at the time, it was actually Chris Hadfield who was in command of the International Space Station. And of course, he made all these educational videos about space and what do astronauts do. Uh, he recorded his space oddity music video, and that really inspired me to look more into uh, space exploration. And when I started my undergrad in engineering, I was looking for opportunities to use my engineering skills for hands-on space-related projects. And the more projects I did, the more I got into space exploration. Oh, that's really cool. And uh, with the Chris Hadfield um, music video, that's always the first thing that comes into my mind when his name comes up, just uh, seeing him play the guitar floating in the International Space Station. Yeah, when I need some extra inspiration, I go back to watch his video. <laughs> it is a good inspirational video, I would say, because how often can you say I played guitar in space? That's the dream one day. <laughs> so you mentioned um, space projects that really got you hooked into space. Um, is there one in particular that really stands out to you? Yeah, I think my favorite project was, uh, it was a part of a competition called International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. And we were an interdisciplinary team of undergraduate students that got together to do this genetic engineering, synthetic biology project. And we came up with an idea of genetically engineering bacteria to turn astronaut species into plastic that can be used in a 3D printer. And the focus was particularly on future human Mars missions and with addressing two big challenges with uh, Mars missions, one being waste recycling and being able to, you know, do something with the waste that astronauts are going to accumulate. Uh, for reference, over a two year mission to Mars, a crew of six astronauts will generate about six tons of solid organic waste, which is about the weight of an elephant. And the other problem is, of course, transporting materials to Mars. Not only is it expensive, but how do you anticipate every little thing that astronauts might need over that two-year mission? And so by using genetic uh, engineering of bacteria and converting this waste product into plastic that can be 3D printed, we thought we could address uh, both of these issues. And eventually that project led to a microgravity project with uh, SETS Canada, Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, and we got to test a particular part of the project in microgravity on a parabolic flight. Well, well I just want to quickly take that all in, backtrack when you say convert human fecal matter into 3D principle plastic, because I read that in your blurb and I was thinking like, 
Oh, that's actually really cool and very innovative and resourceful because I mentioned all that waste is just being brought back down and I don't know what they do with it afterwards. Mm -hmm. I imagine it's not very recyclable at that point. So it's, I think turning it into something useful would probably be very handy. Have you been able to successfully convert any material into 3D printed plastic? Yeah, so in the lab, we were able to, first of all, successfully engineer a bacteria that could feed on uh, what we used was a simulant of human poop. Uh, NASA actually has a recipe for how to make simulants of human waste because they use it to test space toilets. And so we were able to confirm that our bacteria can produce this bioplastic. Um, and another aspect that we worked on is, you know, naturally bacteria produces this plastic internally. And so we were also able to engineer bacteria to basically spit the plastic out into the liquid that the bacteria is in. And on the engineering side of things, we worked on developing a start to finish process. So assuming you have the biology, the bacteria that works, how do you actually get from astronauts poop to the final plastic product. And, uh, and that's uh, on that aspect of the project, we tested separate steps of the process in uh, on the lab scale. But uh, as I mentioned, we tested one part in microgravity. Okay. And uh, when you keep saying and genetically engineer this bacteria, so do you have to test out different species to find out which is the best one? And is it, I'm guessing it must involve a lot of trial and error at this point. Yeah, I think it, it, as a future direction, choosing the organism is definitely something to consider. But for the sake of the competition, uh, we use just E. coli bacteria, which is most commonly used for genetic engineering. And uh, it, it is really a, more of a proof of concept. If we can engineer E. coli to do this, we should be able to engineer another organism, another bacteria to do it. And there are certainly species that are more suitable for the harsh uh, space environment than E. coli would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense because I've always I've seen some articles and papers w when it comes to International Space Station research. They've been testing different bacteria in these. Uh, zero gravity or no gravity conditions to see how they respond in that new environment. So it's pretty cool that you're figuring out which one's the best to pr break down human waste and use it into material that the astronauts could potentially use to create parts that they need for the station, rather mm -hmm. than wasting a launch and probably millions of dollars to get them mm -hmm. just a few odds and ends. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, on the space station, they basically dehydrate the feces and just uh, throw them, throw bags of feces out into space. But of course, uh, Earth pulls the bags of poop back towards the atmosphere and they would burn in, in the atmosphere and look like shooting stars. So if you ever made a wish that didn't come true, maybe it was a burning bag of poop. <laughs> but so it was, uh, yeah, it was literally it, dumping on their wish then. <laughs> 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 yes, you could say so. But an interesting issue, it, when you go to Mars and you're in this closed space of a small, a relatively small rocket, and you get further and further away from Earth gravity, and if you try to throw bags of poop out into space, all of a sudden the biggest gravitational pull is from the rocket itself. So these bags of poop would actually start orbiting the rocket. And that would definitely be an issue. Oh, just trying to imagine you look out your window. It's like, oh, that's what I had for lunch yesterday. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can't think yes. of a picture that would just, well, an image, something that would just ruin an image of looking at Mars and you just see that float in front of the window. Yeah, that would not be the inspirational image you want to see. <laughs> it would make for an interesting movie or a scene in a movie, I'd say. <laughs> so... And when you, so you have bacteria, you have genetic engineering and you have engineering. So it looks like you found biology and engineering as your preferred fields to getting into space. So was there something in particular early on in high school that made you think this, it's those two fields I want to focus on to get into space exploration? I think for me, I've always had a very 
technical, like scientific mindset. I've always liked sciences and problem solving and math. And so in that sense, engineering really appealed to me. And it's once I started engineering and joined the chemical engineering program, um, I decided we, we had a program, a minor in biomedical engineering in my undergrad. And uh, I decided to give it a try because I also did have a bit of an interest in medicine and biology. And so biomedical engineering really proved to be my perfect spot because I can get this medical and biology environment while really focusing on the engineering skills and being able to apply my engineering in the context of medicine and biology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that definitely. I think looking, combining those two fields has become extremely, it was beneficial decades ago, and I think it's becoming even more beneficial now, especially when they're finding new experiments, new technology to develop by looking at both biological and technical uh, advances. And so, but medicine definitely in the end wasn't what you really wanted to do, at least applying it to space. I mean, with biomedical engineering background, that has certainly inspired an interest in space medicine. And I think if anything, I'm most interested in um, creating solutions to help astronauts be healthy in space, and especially once we go to long duration space flight to the moon and to Mars. Yeah, how? So I'm guessing you must be quite uh, excited for the eventual landing on the first woman, the next man to go on the moon? Absolutely. Yeah, those were very exciting announcements recently, especially with Canadian astronauts participating in those future missions. Yeah, I remember reading that announcement. I think it was really cool that Canada and other countries have started to get more involved and see the initiative firsthand. But I really just want to see that landing happen because I think it's going to be the highlight of, they say 2024, but I'm just going to say whatever year it, mm -hmm. when it happens, <laughs> I think. Yeah, and I think also the interesting aspect of it is, you know, in my life and our generation, I think all we've known is the space station. That's all we've witnessed in, in our um, lifetime. And this is going to be this new exciting thing. And, you know, it may be equivalent to the first moon landing. Um, for us, like as a generation, it, it is our first moon landing. Yeah, I feel like everyone past <laughs> born after the early 1970s are going to lose their minds when it happens. And everyone who's from the Apollo era is going to go like, eh seen it before it's like <laughs> yeah it's, it's like I don't remember it be feeling like this last time <laughs> kind of thing but no I think for us I know that we're probably if they say like oh you have to be up at 3 a.m where you are it's like yeah I'm staying up I'm not going to bed I, yeah absolutely <laughs> it's gonna be one of those th things that you can't miss live and watch recorded the next day you need to be up and see it firsthand because it'll be history uh playing yeah absolutely and so Let's say hypothetically, if you did get an, you were asked, say, we want you to come to Mars to run all the experiments, but the catch is you wouldn't be able to return to Earth at that point. Would you take it? No. No. I have, I've thought about it before, and I certainly, if I go to Mars, I want to at least have a chance to return. I, I do realize that there are risks that are gonna come with going to Mars, even if there is a return mission planned. But I certainly, I wanna go back to Earth and I perhaps have a little bit of an unpopular opinion in the sense that I, I'm not sure I agree that we should go and colonize Mars, at least in, um, sh anytime soon, but I do think that we should go to Mars to establish research stations there and, and do research and do science there and kind of rotate astronauts as opposed to, you know, go to Mars for the sake of having people live there permanently. So you would say a science or like a reconnaissance station would probably be a lot better for us. That's what I think. And uh, there Bill Nye shared some thoughts about that in the past as well. And 
he made a point about how as humans we are really used to this earth environment and we crave you know the fresh air the the nature and similarly how you know we don't have people living in the arctic for a reason but we do have research stations there it's valuable place to do science and so we have rotations and his point was that similarly to these uncomfortable environments on earth when we go to Mars, people will get tired really quick of having to put on a spacesuit to go outside and uh, being in the closed, confined environments. And I think I would agree with that. But maybe in the future, we develop better technologies to, um, you know, make things more, feel more Earth-like at least. Yeah, I think... I, I don't know a lot about um, terraforming and how that technology works. I don't think we really have anything substantial that can help because we can't even make in a hostile environments on our own planet to habitable to us. So I can't imagine doing it to an entire planet. But mm -hmm. I would I do think a science station or a recon station should be the first thing we should focus on at least before even thinking about building cities because we haven't even seen if we can even get a space station around that planet, let alone mm -hmm. build infrastructure on it. So I love the optimism of um, SpaceX the, and the, all the other private companies because I love it, it shows innovation, but mm -hmm. there comes a point where you have to bring reality back <laughs> to it because you haven't really shown yet you can even do the simple part and get something there, let alone say oh we're going to have a city or get people there within the next um at least at the end of this decade or something along those mm -hmm. lines ambitious i'm not going to say impossible because i didn't think they could self-land booster rockets before and mm -hmm. they proved me wrong there but i want to say i'm very optimistic about that yeah i'm definitely looking forward to seeing how that develops because spacex has definitely pushed the boundaries and push the limits and so and with all this talk about we've been talking about infrastructure talking about colonization and uh, of all the projects that you've done which has been able to hopefully you do work on the international space station uh so i wanted to ask since you're in your phd what would you say are the next steps like for it's the one question we always get hating asked it's like what do we want to do after our phd so for you what is your ideal next steps? I, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I still have a couple of years, probably maybe a little more to figure that out. But I think for me, the ideal would be to um, get involved in a space industry, whether it's working in the government sector or whether it's working with the many commercial companies that are starting to um, develop, especially in Canada, and uh, particularly the field that interests me the most is life sciences and space, as well as the space med medicine and um, making devices and developing technologies that would help uh, us keep astronauts healthy in space. And do you think everything you have learned from the project converting fecal matter to plastics, you would want to use what you've learned from that project to apply it to the working for those companies and maybe even develop or further develop i mean uh that project is something that could become even bigger not just for the international space station but could also be used on earth because then it would solve uh like quite a bit of the human waste issue that we probably have here mm -hmm. yeah that would be the dream and uh, that project whether it you know moves forward or not it has been a great learning experience, especially uh, based on the fact that it was a very interdisciplinary project. There are many health sciences students and bi biological sciences students and engineering students that were uh, all working together and computer science students all working together to make this project happen. And I think that's where most innovation comes from is when you're able to put together these interdis interdisciplinary teams. 
No, I agree. I think that's the one thing I love about um, planetary science and space. It's such an interdisciplinary field that we can bring everyone from, as you said, engineers, computer scientists, biologists, health students. And even now we're seeing law students, psychologists, um, business and marketing people coming in because it's they're show, seeing how quickly the space sector is growing, especially this past mm -hmm. five years that we've never seen it grow. Like we look 10 years ago, it would be the occasion it would be the rover mars missions those were the highlights uh, mm -hmm. back then now it's there's so much happening that we don't even know what to focus on anymore because <laughs> yeah. i think every day there's either a new mission announced a launch test coming up i think we had the transporter one launch from spacex just a couple of days ago which was mm -hmm. very went very successful i was quite happy to to see that and i always love watching that rocket self land itself yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, gets me every time. I don't think I'm ever going to get sick of it. <laughs> and Virgin Galactic had a mission not not too long ago, and it's yeah, uh, it's certainly the interdisciplinary nature of space exploration is definitely one of the highlights for me. And also, I agree in in the recent, even the last couple of months, there's been so much uh, going on in the space industry. There's so many new players coming. And now it's it is exciting also to see this growing collaboration between government space uh, or agencies and the commercial space sector. Yeah, seeing all these companies, big and small, uh, start up is actually it's showing a little bit of hope in terms of space exploration. Even because a lot of the time we always relied on waiting for NASA to say when's the next big mission, and then we'd have to wait for that to happen. Now we still have big missions happening where we have uh, Mars Perseverance will be arriving in February. And mm -hmm. we, which I think would be by the time this comes out, will probably be the, around, close to it some um, right after it's landing. So we mm -hmm. might actually get to see it uh, before yeah, or after here. Exciting. So I want to be, I'm not going to say next month just in case but mm -hmm. uh, and then we've also got exomars we have now that's been announced dragonfly that will go to saturn's moon titan and all these lunar missions that are happening through commercial com sectors as well as nasa and other com uh, space agencies i mean such as the chinese space agency and i know the mm -hmm. europeans and the russians so i think i just love all of this um new push forwards it's, it's an exciting time for space flight for sure no it definitely is an exciting time for space flight and i think um with your you mentioning uh making sure astronauts stay healthy in space i think what you're wanting to do is going to be very beneficial for future space flights to come mm -hmm. so and um i was also when i noticed your blurb as well it said that you are a member of SEDS. you mentioned them earlier so i uh, You've also got a little bit of like public engagement and working with uh, young professionals and students. So what is it that brought you to help um, one fellow student such as yourself? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm on board of directors with SETS Canada. And my first involvement with SETS Canada was participating in that uh, microgravity project. So, uh, you know, so what SETS Canada does is create these project uh, opportunities for students, uh, particularly post-secondary students, to gain hands-on experiences in the space uh, field and the space industry. And being, it was just such an, like a dream come true, being able to fly on microgravity, experience microgravity and fly on a parabolic flight. And, and it was all thanks to, you know, SEDS Canada and our partners. Uh, including the CSA and NRC, and that, especially when I started getting interested in space exploration, I didn't really know where to go to find opportunities as a student, especially in Western Canada, and in a way, I almost tried to create opportunities for myself like bringing all these space ideas to any team project that i was involved in and then really doing this project with sets canada opened up my view of all the other opportunities that are available to students and again it was just such a great experience in terms of you know getting engineering skills technical skills space 
uh, specific skills and getting to know the space community in Canada that uh, I wanted to help other students uh, experience this. And I want students in Canada to know that these opportunities exist and that they can, you know, use the resources that are available. Yeah, no, I think um, getting all of these, bringing the experience to you is very important. I mean, I, uh, especially when you said you didn't have a lot of um, uh, opportunities, at least out West at first, you made your own, which I think is very cool. So, and, but you mentioned trying to find um, projects to try and throw space in. Was that during your undergrad when you were in um, Calgary? Yes, yeah. So I, I guess it started with some of smaller course projects. Like whenever we had a course project uh, that involved some hands-on aspect or had us design something, I would always, you know, propose something space related. Uh, for example, one of my course projects was um, trying to, you know, develop a concept for a device that could help prevent muscle and bone loss in astronauts. And then I was involved in generating the idea for this poop to plastic project. Um, there was another project in this competition in the year before that I also helped with the space uh, related idea. And I think also just space inspires people. So whenever a space, cool space idea comes up, people get very excited and very interested. And uh, that's that certainly helped me create opportunities for myself to get involved in space related projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, when, when you were working with SEDS and uh, maybe working with some of these projects that they've been uh, promoting and developing as well. Uh, so what is it that brought you to SEDS when you were, is it when you mainly when you were reaching out, seeing what opportunities there were for students? Or was it after you started creating these opportunities for yourself that you came across SEDS? Yeah, we came across SEDS uh, right after presenting our Poop to Plastic project at the international competition. And here we were we were with the space project and the competition was over and it was kind of like, okay, what do we do next and where do we take this project next? And that's when we just saw, you know, the application on social media, I think it was the Canadian Space Agency that shared it on their social media. And we said, you know, let's apply to this and see what happens and see if we can get into the competition. Uh, we applied, we got in and, uh, you know, through another six, seven, eight months of hard work, we we're able to get our uh, payload together to, to fly it on the parabolic flight. Oh, all that. Oh, wow. I mean, I'm trying to, trying to pitch that now. Um, so what, how excited are you for, to get that on there? Oh, I, yeah, it was, ex it was so exciting and, you know, experiencing microgravity was truly a dream come true. And it's such a truly out of this world experience, uh, you know, no pun intended there, but it, it's, it's because it's, you know, microgravity is, is ex an experience that you can't really get on a day-to-day -day basis. And so when you experience something like that for the first time, it's just, it's really hard to describe and it's, it's really hard to imagine what it's like. Yeah, it's like, it's one thing I wish I could experience um, at some point in my life. It's like a bucket, life bucket list to just experience uh, zero to low gravity conditions, mm -hmm. uh, just getting going up to the air and plunging straight down on the plane and then coming right back up and feeling even if it even for a couple minutes and I'll go like you know what I'm fine now I can I'm good this is even yeah, if we yeah. ended right now I'd be satisfied <laughs> yes yeah, just a warning that they do call it a vomit comet for a good reason I have heard horror stories of um vomits mid uh float I guess you would say. <laughs> yeah, that, that did not happen to any of us in the middle of the parabola. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's good. I mean, it's good that you guys didn't have to deal with that, probably the mess it would have made <laughs> at that point. And, yeah, uh, certainly. And so with all this experience you got from SEDS, um, since you said you found it um, hard at first to find opportunities for students, if for any students listening right now, is there any piece of advice you would probably give them? 
my my first piece of advice would be to you know really do their research and see what's out there i think over the years the opportunities that are in canada uh, have gotten better there's more opportunities and at sets canada we're certainly trying to you know reach out to our western uh, part of canada more and uh, to reach out to a greater demographic of students as well and my other piece of advice is, um, you know, creating opportunities for yourself as well. Again, in my example, the only thing that was really that already existed at Calgary at the time when I started my undergrad that at least that I knew of was a rocketry team. And I realized that I, I wasn't really that interested in rockets and building rockets. And that's where kind of proposing my own projects and bringing ideas to the table uh, really helped with, you know, getting experience in the particular space field that I was interested in. And another, my probably my last piece of advice would be to talk to other students. And even at SETS Canada, we're happy to connect students with um, other students and um, even just reaching out to um, you know, people that are in the space industry that you see online, I think the social media engagement is really great now, and that helps to, you know, get you connected to people. Yeah, I think the being able to connect with so many people through numerous platforms has made it a lot easier for uh, students and the young professionals to find um, assistance, advice, opportunities, which I don't think we had about 10 years ago, where mm -hmm. unless you knew someone, you or at a giant school, like one of the few in a country, you would never really know about these opportunities. So yeah. I, yeah, I think staying engaged and keeping an eye on things online is probably one of the best ways to to do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So Alina, I want to get to the question portion of our podcast, and I want to ask you the first one: If you could send a mission to any celestial body in the solar system, where would you want it to go? I think it would be cool to go to at least one of those Earth-like um, exoplanets that we've identified and, uh, you know, try to see what it's like there. Is there any sign of life there? No, I think, oh, is there one in mind that you've got? Maybe a name you want to drop? Mm, not specific one, but I guess whatever is the easiest to get to. I know there are several <laughs> uh, Earth-like planets that we've found so far. Yeah, I have seen quite a few, I think more and more keep popping up every year or so. And mm -hmm. um, we, we, we know very little about them other than they have an atmosphere and whether or not there's actually maybe liquid water, we're not, we're not entirely sure. But mm -hmm. that makes sense. We're seeing them at such a far distance. But I think, yeah, even if we send it just a probe, just to crash land and take quick pictures and maybe quickly do some analysis before it dies would be very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully our technology gets uh, to the point where we can go and visit those planets soon. Yeah, exoplanet Voyager. I think that's what we need. <laughs> and so yes. the second question, uh, what would you say is your favorite spin-off technology that's come from space exploration? I'm going to have to go with my phone and all the space technologies that, you know, enable all the functions on our phones. Uh, particularly maybe like things like Google Maps and uh, maps in general, they, they help me every day. Yeah, my favorite for the phone is the camera since it's a little chip and I, it took me, I didn't know that that came from space exploration. So it made me appreciate me, appreciate taking a photo every time with my phone now. Yeah, that's a good point too. I definitely like my camera as well. <laughs> And so for our final question, since this is the Diaries of Space Explorers, I want to ask you, who is your favorite space explorer? You know, I've been thinking about this question and I've been fortunate to meet so many amazing space explorers that I absolutely cannot pick one favorite. Instead, I will flip it around and say that space explorers are my favorites. Just all of them? Yes, yes. Any space explorer. They're great people. Oh, okay. You know what? I was not expecting an answer like that. And you know what? I kind of like it. 
It's um, <laughs> you, showing that you can get inspiration from many, I think anyone, whether it's from a, a pilot who became an astronaut, an engineer who launched a rocket, or a scientist who managed to discover, I'm putting this down, find, to successfully find bacteria that can break down fecal matter <laughs> to then yes. create 3D plastic printing that's printable so yeah absolutely i we cannot do space exploration without every single person that is involved at all the different levels yeah no we have we have to look at them at all levels whether it's from the big pictures all to the smaller parts to even if it's like calibrating something that still plays a huge role mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely so Alina, I just wanted to thank you for coming onto the podcast. It was very cool to hear about your experience coming to your PhD and your very cool project. Um, I think it's giving me an idea for a title already, so I'm going to work <laughs> something witty with it. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure and fun chatting to you about space. Thank you for listening to the Diaries of Space Explorers, where we have been speaking with Alina Kuniskaya about her journey to space and her fascinating project on, using, on recycling astronaut fecal matter using microbes and turning them into 3D printable material. If you would like to learn more about Alina's work, you can follow her on Twitter at akunisk, which is A-K-U-N-I-T-S-K, or on Instagram at astronaut in the making, or you can find her on Facebook and LinkedIn at Alina Kuniskaya. I am your host, Gavin Tolometti, and if you'd like to learn more about the show, you can email us at thediariespaceexplorers at gmail.com, or you can follow us on Twitter at Diaries of Space, or Instagram at Diaries of Space Explorers. Thank you for listening, and see you all next time. <laughs>